Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Upfront. I am Song Serian. Back in April 2012, Kim Jong-un was officially appointed as Supreme Leader of North Korea. On today's Upfront, we discuss more about the North Korean society under Kim Jong-un regime, which has just entered its fourth year. And for that discussion, we have a great panel of guests today. With the adoption of the UN Human Rights Council resolution on North Korean human rights in March, as well as a recent agreement on the Iranian nuclear program, our attention has been turned to North Korea once again as Kim Jong-un enters his fourth year. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has been carrying out a reign of terror over the past three years. Along with the execution of his uncle Chang Song Tech, Kim Jong-un has purged top government officials, wiping out any potential source of dissidents. He has also undertaken a series of military provocations, including North Korea's third nuclear test. On the other hand, Kim Jong-un, who has been educated abroad, is now emphasizing the livelihoods of the people and economic growth. He is also increasingly shown making efforts to approach the public. Does this mean we can hope for more open-mindedness from the young leader? Still, Kim Jong-un's mysterious ways have continued, from his disappearance last year to continued military provocations, despite having stressed the importance of improved inter-Korean relations in his New Year's speech. Would it be possible for Kim Jong-un to maintain a strong grip on power while improving his public image at the same time? On today's Upfront, we discuss the outlook for the North Korean regime under Kim Jong-un and recommendations for the international community. To give us more insights into today's topic, we have Professor Chung so Young, a professor of international studies at Korea University. And we have Mr. Kim Gwang Jin, a senior fellow at Institute for National Security Strategy. Professor Andre Lankov, professor of social studies at Kungmin University. And also uh, Dr. Park Kyung Jung, a senior research fellow at Korea Institute for National Reunification. Welcome all for being here today. Let's start with this, this uh, uh, topic, a young leader. Uh, that's a characterization that we can describe the young uh, leader in the North Korea. How would you assess the past three years of reign uh, under Kim Jong-un? Uh, we'll start with uh, Professor Zhao. Well, uh, this is somewhat a unique situation in North Korea considering the other two leaders before. And I think uh, what uh, Kim Jong-un is trying to do is to you know, make sure that uh, North Korea, to the North Korean people, that uh, we're going to be more international. But I would not allow you know, something disturbance happen. Uh, so I want to make sure that political regime sh should be maintained strongly. And I, will, I can promise to you that uh, I will boost the economy. So in other words, that uh, what Kim Jong-un has been uh, doing in North Korea he is a more inward looking, mm -hmm. utilizes some of his experiences of the world and to make sure that uh, politically stabilized and economically boosted. I think that this is something that he has been doing. I see. Mr. Kim, what's your feeling? Uh, actually, on North Korean terms, uh, his reign for mm -hmm. the last four years is pretty much successful mm -hmm. uh, uh, as compared with his uh, young age. And being too young is a handicap for himself. So he's trying to avoid that handicap by advertising that his father, Kim mm -hmm. Jong-il, started his revolutionary activities at uh, North Korean Workers' Party mm -hmm. at the age of 22. Mm -hmm. And in 1969, he became the head of two important uh, party uh, departments. OGD, one is in you know, organization and, and guidance department, and the other one is propaganda department. So at the age of 27, he became the, the head of these two important you know, departments. So they are now advertising that his father was younger than himself. I see. Uh, and in terms of international standard, uh, four years was a deadlock. 
uh, mm. for the for for the you know uh, nuclear talks, of course, and also for South North relations. So. Uh, I should say there are two different, you know, attitudes, views mm -hmm. for the last four years. Okay, I see. Uh, Professor Lankov. Uh, well, I can basically agree with what has been said, uh, because obviously his major goal is to have economic growth while keeping political stability. And so far, his first attempts have been quite successful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not widely realized, but they are already, have already initiated uh, so quite radical economic reforms. Radical by the North Korean standards, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but sort of reminiscent uh, of what China used to do in the late 1970s, at the very early stages. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he is remarkably repressive. He uh, is willing to kill top officials on the scale the North Korea has not seen for many decades. Mm -hmm. And he is now trying to close the border and uh, prevent circulation of the information, uncontrolled, uncensored information about the outside world. So he wants to have, obviously, economic growth, and he understands he has to have at least a bit of market, or maybe a lot of market, to get the growth, mm -hmm. while remaining fully in control. And so far, he's doing well. Okay. Uh, Dr. Park. Uh, the fact that uh, Kim Jong-il is, Kim Jong -il is young has not affected uh, influenced North Korea policy very much, I think. And North Korea is uh, very much uh, a web of uh, constraints. And mm -hmm. North Kim Jong-un moved his policy in this, uh, under these constraints. And I suppose uh, North Korea's policy has changed very much uh, in 2009. And 2009 is a very important year for creative succession. The succession has started. Mm -hmm. And in terms of foreign relations, in terms of security policy, North Korea would like to be acknowledged as a nuclear power. And uh, South Korea policy and nuclear policy from that time on have been very aggressive. North Korea has been very aggressive. And this con uh, there is a continuity in nuclear weapons development and aggressive South Korea policy from that time on. This mm -hmm. is one point. And in economic terms, it is true that uh, Kim Jong-un has introduced much, uh, uh, several kinds of reforms in North Korea. But I suppose Kim Jong-un, in economic terms, Kim Jong-un has also, uh, also been lucky in, mm -hmm. the, in the sense that uh, during the 2010, uh, from 2010 and 12 or 13, the mineral price, international mineral price high, uh, peaked in mm -hmm. 2010. And uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, mineral, uh, mineral export is very, uh, the most important sources of foreign currency. And uh, because of uh, increased, uh, uh, increase of uh, minerals and increase the increased uh, price of minerals, North Korea benefits very much. Mm -hmm. And in, in that sense, uh, North Korean economy has uh, improved, but mm -hmm. it probably is not uh, solely from economic reforms. And and during, uh, because of aggressive foreign policy, North Korea's isolation has deepened during mm -hmm. uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, reign. And it seems like there are a lot of challenges. But w what comes out, uh, I'm curious, as to whether um, you, you think that the, the Kim Jong-un has uh, solidified his power. I mean, for the last uh, three years, we have seen a uh, reign of terror. He, he killed the high-ranking officials, and also we see, we've seen a lot of executions of North Korean, North Korean people. Now, has he been successful in uh, establishing himself as a leader himself? Well, what do you think, Mr. Kim? Yeah, actually, you know, he killed his uncle, mm -hmm. and uh, his father and grandfather didn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a really, you know, high uh, tension of terror, and he's now reigning with that power. And I should say that in short term, it helps him, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, he is consolidating his power with this kind of you know, terror. But in medium and longer term, I don't think it will help himself, to, uh, it will help his reigning. I see. In that sense, one, one of the factions in North Korea would be military. Um, as he consolidated his power and his efforts, we also saw a lot of uh, military provocations happening. Now, is that a legitimate security threat for the neighboring countries, or is it, does it have a more of a, a domestic purpose of kind of consolidating people under his power? Uh, what do you think? 
Dr. Park? Uh, we can say North Korea is, North Korea is a fresh nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And in the history of uh, uh, nuclearization, every fresh nuclear power uh, becomes very aggressive. Because they think, now I have nuclear power. You must accept um, uh, me as a nuclear power. If you don't accept me as a nuclear power, I'll uh, cause you so that you accept me as a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, after the second nuclear test in 2009, we have experienced Chonan attack and Yanping shelling. And also uh, with the third nuclear test in 2013, North Korea uh, uh, reaction to South Korea's and U.S. Uh, military training has been very aggressive. Mm -hmm. and, and they have uh, experimented, experimented more than 100 missiles last year. So mm -hmm. North Korea is now demanding that you must, uh, South Korea and the United States and other countries, uh, in, in, including even China, you must accept me as a nuclear power. If you don't, mm -hmm. I'll uh, make you that you accept me as mm -hmm. a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And I expect that North, Korea, North Korea's aggressiveness would continue until some solution, resolution about nuclear uh, position, status of North Korea is solved. I see. One of the great stabilizing force, of course, is economy. And uh, what we've, we're seeing, what's happening in North Korea is pretty tantalizing. Uh, some people say that the high rate of growth. Um, it seems like Kim Jong-un is sending the message that I'm going to take care of you, this is a great matter, then, and North Korean government will be uh, focused on economic development and innovation. Is that a change of attitudes, or what do you think about the outlook of that, uh, Professor uh, well, It's a big change, uh, because the policy of late Kim Jong-il, his father, was very simple. Do not reform. And he was right, uh, because reforms might, it's not save the regime, might. Uh, but reforms are still very risky. Mm -hmm. So Kim Jong-il, when he was still alive, he assumed that he should not change anything. So the regime would probably stable, remain stable for another five or 10 years or 20 years maybe, which was more than enough for somebody in his late 60s. Mm -hmm. So he did not change anything. Sometimes he accepted the changes which happened anyway, like, say, private markets everywhere, a significant part of the population making money in the unofficial economy. He accepted it grudgingly, but didn't do it. And uh, Kim Jong-un's policy is different. He wants to start reforms, and he sees the brilliant, stunning success of China, and uh, somewhat less impressive, but still really, really great success of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So he knows the way, and he's going to obviously go that way, uh, partially maybe because he even cares about his people, uh, but largely because he cares about political stability, and he understands that now, when North Korea is uh, uh, lagging so much behind virtually all its neighbors, mm -hmm. it's potentially it's a very explosive situation. So he needs to narrow the gap. Right. And the only way is to reform the economy, essentially introducing capitalism. Mm -hmm. without admitting open. I see. Uh, I suppose uh, the most important economic reform measures for North Korea is to reduce tension with neighboring countries. Yes, economic reform measures. The most important economic reform measures is to reduce tension with neighboring countries. Yeah. Because... Right. After all, the, the, the domestic economy is closely tied to the diplomacy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, North Korea is... Uh, yes, yeah, it is true that North Korea introduced some reform measures. Uh, and, but in order to succeed in reform, you must have uh, foreign technology, foreign, mm -hmm. uh, cap uh, mm -hmm. foreign capital, and uh, foreign markets. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese and Vietnamese reform has succeeded because they have good relations with the United States and, uh, and Japan and other Western countries. Uh, even if they, if, uh, they have bad relations with uh, the United States and other Western countries, even if they reformed, they cannot have foreign technology, foreign capital, and foreign markets. Mm -hmm. Now, North Korea has uh, introduced some economic measures. Yes, initially, it, uh, it uh, contributes to boost the domestic uh, productivity. But in order to step further, North Korea must uh, reduce mm -hmm. tension with uh, uh, other countries. Otherwise, for example, uh, they cannot uh, have uh, attract investment. They, can, they cannot uh, export anything to uh, Western countries. Right. And I suppose 
rather they stagnate. And uh, Kim Jong Un uh, would confront more challenges because of the economic reforms mm -hmm. in the future, in the, in the coming uh, years. A great point. Uh, speaking of investment, uh, right. we have this Asian Infrastructure uh -huh. Investment Bank uh -huh. that North Korea wanted to join, uh -huh. but uh, uh, apparently uh, China has uh, declined that. But the, the fact that the North Korea was uh, fully intending to join that, uh, doesn't it represent their kind of resolve and, and strong will to focus on the economic development? Right. I think uh, that uh, obviously demonstrates that uh, North Korea needs money. Uh, mm -hmm. When you talk about the growth, it's a very simple matter how you can bring money mm -hmm. inside. Looking at that issue, actually, it's not a simple way for us to bring enough money to North Korea. Mm -hmm. You know, there are only two possible sources. One is public money. The other one is private money uh, for North Korea. As we all know, the public money availability has been constrained because of the sanctions. You know, they cannot get any funding from any UN organization because of the Security Council resolution. Unless it is lifted, uh, North Korea is not accessible to any UN organization to get any kind of funding, including the World Bank. Mm -hmm. So this is a situation where they are. Private, uh, it's extremely difficult as we now know because there are not many business opportunities available from a foreign investor's point of view in North Korea. And in terms of the quality of labor, there are concerns. Uh, that's the fact that uh, whether or not North Korea can provide cheap but efficient uh, quality of the labor forces to foreign companies. So this is something that North Korea needs to make sure that we can do it. It will take some time. Mm -hmm. So what the North Korea is considering to do, from my point of view, possibly two or three ways. Number one, uh, why they are interested in the, this infrastructure investment bank is because it's outside the UN system. Mm -hmm. So they are not constrained by UN resolutions. So, and they might thought that the China might be favorable for North Korea on this matter. But what China is sending the message, unless you make sure about the nuclear issue, we are not actually help you out. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one of the general messages that we can get. In the sense, uh, if uh, South Korea, from the South Korea's point of view, if we want to you know, work together with North Korea in this sense, then we can provide some incentives to North Korea. For instance, uh, there is a uh, sort of very related intergovernmental organization, which is outside the UN system, that mm -hmm. is led by the South Korea, that's Global Green Growth Institute. Right. The main purpose of this organization is to help out developing countries to develop their growth planning in a low carbon way. It's a surprising fact that in terms of per capita emission of the CO2, North Korea's level is much higher than any other similar level of economic you know, size of the developing countries mm -hmm. because they are cutting trees. And so uh, you know, they are emitting a lot of CO2s. And then they also need to have access to the energy. And what I'm saying here, GGGI can provide you know, very effective growth planning for North Korea. And this is an international organization. This is not something that South Korea has to take all those burdens. It's along with other countries as well. Mm -hmm. So this is one typical example. And there are several other available sources as well, you know, including some sources from South Korea. With this kind of combination, then, then we can actually help out North Korea so that we can bring more stabilized peace and prosperity in, in Northeast Asia in general, and possibly thinking about the unification in the Korean Peninsula. Right, thank you. Before we leave the economic issue, because it's fascinating. Mr. Kim, is this a good time for North Korean people who are entrepreneurial and want to do something outside of com communist traditional kind of restrictive rules? You mean IIB or? Their... Or uh, using that investment opportunity or, um, of course, that, that's uh, temporarily blocked at this point, but uh, for the uh, businessmen in North Korea, do you think they are more hopeful that uh, things will uh, get better business-wise? Uh, I don't think you know, it will, they will have a dramatic change uh, mm. or very fast or all-out change in the incoming months and years. Uh, actually, Kim Jong-un's first, uh, Kim Jong-un's choice of his first national strategy was the, uh, the uh, simultaneous in the development of nuclear program and also their own economy, which is very uh, contra uh, contradictory. Uh, and uh, he also, you know, designated some more places uh, as a new economic zone, but there is no progress for that. Nobody wants to invest there. Uh, and of course, you know, he uh, embraced some market you know, elements uh, into the state economic system by, you know, 
uh, making small, smaller uh, units for the farming, you know, uh, units, and and also introducing, you know, May 30 mm -hmm. uh, measures into industrial, you know, area. But still, it is not full scale change, and they are not doing it openly, uh, and you know, it's not an all out, you know, change and reform. So they have a lot of troubles, you know, and also it is very interesting to see that China is turning down North Korea's an application for AIB. Uh, actually, North Korea wants to be wants to benefit from that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, you know, in a longer run, uh, that AIB will be uh, of great help in the process of, you know, unifying mm -hmm. uh, our two. Uh, you know, north and south. Right. In that process, you know, economically and also, you know, having, you know, uh, with the provision of more money uh, for mm -hmm. the economic, you know, uh, development, prosperity, I think it will be of great help in the long, long run. Right. In, in amidst that effort, uh, North Korea takes a hit uh, on the human rights side. Uh, on March 27th, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a resolution condemning North Korea for its uh, ever worsening uh, human rights situation, and especially in the wake of the purge of uh, uh -huh. Tech. And there are uh, talk of about 10,000 people displaced, uh, the 400 people getting uh, executed and things like that. Now, uh, predictably, I, th I think that the North Korea has reacted uh, by saying that there's a conspiracy internationally to isolate them. and. <coughs> and interfere with their domestic affairs, and they objected to the establishment of UN uh, Human Rights Office in Seoul. Do you think that the human rights issue that was raised internationally, do you think that will help the situation in, the U, uh, in North Korea? We, when we developed a sort of policy package, we always would write in code both uh, you know, carrots and sticks. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, looking at the human rights, it's about the uh, sticks uh, to ensure that you know, North Korea should be a member of the global society, respecting all these available standards. Mm -hmm. So in the sense that it is always very important and good items from policy point of view. And then giving the message to North Korea, uh, we understand that the human rights is part of the very core of the domestic sovereignty issue. But still, you need to make sure that you need to maintain the global standard. So it's a very good uh, sign toward North Korea to ensure that you must be a member of the global society. At the same time, after that, if we were to move step forward or even more, then, then we need to develop a little more concrete and efficient strategies. How we can actually ensure the uh, leveling of the you know, human rights you know, standard in North Korea. In the sense, it will be very helpful to consider uh, the two different categories of the human rights. Mm -hmm. When we talk about human rights, we tend to talk about political and civil rights. And at the same time, there are another important group of human rights, that's the economic and social rights. Mm -hmm. So as we discussed today, that uh, because you know, driving force that we can bring positive way to North Korea is about the economic side. So we tend to work on economic and social standards first, and ensuring that uh, you know, North Korea then can move toward the uh, political and civil you know, human rights standard as well. So it's a package. Actually, we can level up the, uh, you know, level up the compliance of the global human rights treaties uh, by North Korea. I think uh, this can be considered as one of the strategies to address these human rights issues. Great. Uh, we've been talking about the politics and economy of North Korea so far. And now we're connected to an expert overseas to hear more about the North Korea's nuclear issue. Sean King, senior vice president of Park Strategies, are uh, here uh, joining us. Hello. The first question I will have you is uh, with Iran uh, agreeing to a denuclearization deal on April 2nd. The international community has turned its attention to uh, North Korean uh, nuclear issues. Uh, do you think that the Iranian agreement would have any impact or bearing on North Korean uh, nuclear program? Well, it won't have any deterrent, if that's what you mean, uh, because the situations are fundamentally different. The Iran deal attempts to delay Iran's time to break out to a nuclear weapon if they wish to do so from two to three months to a year. The problem is, is that North Korea has already broken out with the nuclear weapon. Iran is at least operating under the pretense that it's for civilian energy use only. 
So the Iran deal cannot be a model for or deterrent to to North Korea because it already has a nuclear weapon. If anything, I see the Iran deal providing North Korea with strategic and business opportunities in Iran because it gives North Korea the chance to strategize and uh, cross-research with Iran on uranium enrichment and or sell it missiles to deliver its nukes if and when it decides to break out. So uh, it's neutral to bad from my point of view. Many experts are saying that the situation in the North is very different from that of Iran. In your mind, in what ways are they different? Well, aside from the fact that North Korea already has a nuclear weapon, one big difference is that Iran is in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT, which North Korea left in 2003. Also, the Iranian economy is much more integrated with the world economy, while North Korea is pretty much isolated aside from its missile, illicit business, and regular business with China. And North Korea, the objective of the nuke is basically regime preservation and or to earn money abroad from illicit weapons sales. Iran, meanwhile, is part of a larger Sunni-Shia struggle across the Middle East with a religious overtone, while it's also funding insurgencies and terrorists in Iraq, Yemen, and Lebanon. So it's part of a much bigger picture, while the North Korea nuke pretty much pertains only to North Korea itself, uh, assuming, of course, they don't sell it for use by a, another party, which they might always do. And then lastly, there was never really any military option as it regards North Korea. With Iran, a few years ago, probably there would have been if the United States had agreed to look the other way if and when Israel tried to take out its nuclear facility. But I'm afraid that that moment has also passed. What do you think is the intention of Pyongyang's continued provocation, even in the face of the Iran's nuclear agreement? Well, three things, really. One, most North Koreans now know, even though the regime does its best to keep them in the dark, that South Koreans are better off than they are. So for purposes of domestic consumption or propaganda, Kim Jong-un needs to be seen as waging war or defending the Korean Peninsula against evil America in South Korea. So by firing off these missiles now and then, he's able to propagate this myth that he's defending Korea against Yankee imperialism. Two, it's a way to keep the outside world powers off balance, hoping that they can then trade a cessation of these propagations for some kind of rewards in the six party talks or some other extortion by committee uh, where North Korea seems to always get the better of us. And lastly, because it doesn't have a real economy, North Korea, for them, the arms trade is big business. And they make a lot of hard currency, which keeps the regime in power by selling their missiles and other parts overseas. And if they don't test them every once in a while and show their customers in the Middle East, Africa, or wherever, that these things actually work, they're not going to sell anything. So really, it serves those three purposes for the regime. Thank you for sharing your insights today. Uh, let's continue to talk about the, the North Korea in the global uh, community, uh, how the global community is viewing the fourth year of uh, North Korean uh, regime under Kim Jong-un. Uh, Professor Lankov, uh, how is the image? Uh, well, as bad as usual. Uh, because North Korea has had very bad press worldwide for many decades, and they don't see any significant change. There are some minor changes, but not much. Uh, there is also a growing understanding that a nuclear deal with North Korea is not going to happen. And at the same time, the key player, <coughs> that is the United States, are not going to compromise, with quite good reasons. They are not going to accept anything but the full, verifiable de denuclearization, which is actually a pipe dream, not going to happen. Uh, so, talking about the international policy, no not, not, not much change. What is important, however, is first, quite bad relations with China. I would not say it's a change of the image, uh, because probably in North, Korea, North Korea has never been really popular in China. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a marriage of convenience. Chinese always despised North Korea. But it was mutual feeling, as a matter of fact. Uh, but uh, relations are unusually bad. Probably we have not seen such a bad state of relations between China and North Korea for many decades since at least 1992, maybe much longer. Uh, another change. And looking for substitute for China, essentially looking for kind of sponsor, provider of the, uh, you know, 
public welfare benefits. Uh, North Koreans are now uh, looking for Russia and they try to improve relations with Russia. Mm -hmm. um, well, they will improve relations, but they probably will not get what they want. That is a great, you know, truckloads of money, not going to happen. Uh, but apart from this crisis in relations with China and attempts to find a replacement in Russia and in some other places, well, basically it's business as usual, mm -hmm. I would say. I see. Uh, speaking of the relationship with China, uh, Mr. Kim, you, uh, we talked about the, the AIIB situation, China turning down the proposal, and the report says it, it came as a shock to the North Korean officials. Do you think it is that bad? Uh, is there any uh, prospect of getting in the China relationship getting better for the North Korea? It is uh, very bad, and I, I can say that it is the worst uh, during the dec decades-long, you know, relations between the two countries. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, President Xi visited Seoul uh, first, and he didn't, you know, may, didn't make any promise to meet, you know, Kim Jong-un yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is no possibility that he's uh, visiting Pyongyang. Uh, so it is r very bad. And also they turned down Pyongyang's proposal to become the member of AIIB. And also uh, the President Xi's personal uh, feeling and attitude towards North Korea, I think is very bad. But still, I don't think there is a strategic change uh, you know, mm -hmm. on the side of China that they want to abandon North Korea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, no strategic you know, decision yet. So it's because of the relations between South Korea and also their interest you know, uh, in relationship with the United States and Japan. Mm -hmm. So it is a big, in the bigger picture, they, are still, they still want to um, you know, maintain the relation uh, you know, to a certain extent uh, with North Korea. One of the efforts that North Korea is making is uh, towards Russia, it mm -hmm. seems, and new development is that there is a, a, a celebration of the end of the war, uh, uh, anniversary of the end of World War II, a uh, 70th anniversary. Uh, Russia has invited uh, mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un and in, invited a whole slew of other uh, world leaders. Now, uh, what do you think the Kim Jong-un's stance would be, what kind of efforts uh, would it give uh, when he goes to Russia and meet with uh, potentially uh, Putin? Uh, he wants money, uh, very simple. Uh, because when they're talking about investment, uh, there is one problem, they don't know how to handle private investment. Uh, when private investments, when they get something, very soon uh, the foreigners who invest into North Korea discover that North Koreans don't let their money to be repatriated. It's a big problem. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the largest investment project so far is now in such a trouble. Mm -hmm. And they don't, simply don't understand that people come with money, not because of some political reasons, but because they want to get more money back and they are not used to private investors. So they would much prefer to do what they have been doing for, well, maybe 60 or 50 years. That is, find some rich country or relatively rich country and make a deal. We are to, to say, uh, basically, we are telling what you want to hear. We vote in the UN, uh, United Nations as you like on some issues, and you give us a lot of money to mm. exchange in political concessions for real hard cash. To an extent, even their relations with China until recently was like that, and maybe even still to some extent with China. And they see, wow, Russia now has bad relations with the United States. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's a new Soviet Union. Let's do what uh, our, grand, our granddad Kim Il sung used to do for decades. Manipulate, play Russians against Chinese, Chinese against Russians, get money from both sides, and give very little symbolic concessions in exchange. So mm -hmm. he wants to get it, but he's not going to get it. Russia wants, indeed, better relations, and Russian investment will happen. But if he wants to have a free right, not going to happen. Very soon he will be disappointed when he will realize that when Russian diplomats say reciprocity, they do mean reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Whether he is going to be seriously, really become really bitter because of this experience, or maybe he will learn something, I know not. Uh, but for the time being, if he goes in Moscow, which is still not clear whether he is going or not, assuming he goes, 
uh, he will probably try to get from Russia a great deal of government supported public investment public money mm -hmm. And again, as I have said, he will get a bit, but not much. Most of the money will come from private Russian sources, and these people will expect to make money in North Korea. But I it see. may be good. It may be good. He will learn finally, maybe, maybe, just maybe, that if you want to get foreign investor, <laughs> you have to play according to the international rules. He may be saying, wow, it's only Westerners like that. Well, he, soon he will see that Russians are no different. It's the I see. I see. In Russia, there, there is a possibility that uh, uh, there would be some summit meetings. Uh, one, uh, I, I think that the, the China's uh, Xi Jinping is also going there. So do, do you think that there is a possibility that there would be a summit meeting between North Korea and China? And also, uh, if uh, President Park is going there, it has been decided, but is there a possibility that the inter-Korean summit might happen there? Uh, Mr. Kim, what do you think? Uh, we still need to wait and see what will happen, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think uh, there. I think you know there is a less possibility that our president Park uh, will visit you know Moscow because uh, uh, because of the international relationship. Uh, of course, you know uh, he she may not lose you know <coughs> things uh, you know even though in terms of uh, the relationship with the North, you know even though she is there. There is no trouble, you know, whether she's meeting him or not. And on the other hand, it will be more pressure, you know, to Kim Jong Un that, you know, uh, for his first de de debut, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the international uh, platform. Uh, but I don't think, you know, uh, uh, President Park uh, will go there. And uh, Kim Jong Un, I think, he will visit, you know, Moscow and. Uh, even though uh, uh, Chinese president uh, will be there, there wouldn't be a very serious talk, you know, between themselves because you know they should be uh, sure what uh, you know progress in North Korea in a nu nuclear program mm -hmm. and also other stuff, you know. I think including the human rights and also the economic, you know, openness and new policies, you know, in. These uh, areas, I think, there should be some progress between the two leaders and also countries. So I don't think there will be a very serious talk between themselves. We've discussed the inter-Korean uh, relations, and now we're connected to experts uh, for a deeper analysis of the relations between Seoul and Pyongyang. It's Charles Armstrong, professor of Korean studies in the social <coughs> sciences at Columbia University. Hello. Neighboring countries have played a critical role in inter-Korean relations, and none better than the uh, United States, who has played a very strong role uh, so far. What's your outlook on the U.S. stance uh, towards inter-Korean relations? Well, the U.S. has been very important, obviously, for South Korea and maintaining an alliance to protect the security of South Korea and also has had a very key role in uh, issues on the Korean Peninsula between North and South. So any improvement of relations between North and South or any change in relations on the Korean Peninsula has to include the United States. Uh, at the moment, the relationship between the U.S. and North Korea is not very good. There have not been many advances made. But uh, in the future, I think the U.S. will play a very critical role in improving the situation on the Korean Peninsula and hopefully opening up improved relations between the U.S. and North Korea and facilitating dialogue between North and South Korea. Uh, lastly, what advice would you offer to the South Korean government? Uh, what more should they do to improve the relations with the North? Well, the South Korean government has to, of course, first of all, ensure the security of the Republic of Korea and has to make sure that its own citizens are uh, not threatened by any instability on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but at the same time, it is very important for the South Korean government to continue to reach out to the North, to respond to any signals from the North that they are willing to engage with the South, uh, and to facilitate improved uh, contact, dialogue, trade, uh, and exchange. So it has to do both things at the same time. It has to focus on the security of the South and avoiding threats from the North, 
but it also m must, I think, and it's very important for the, the South Korean government to encourage greater dialogue with... with well, thank you for your comments today. Now, let's talk about inter-Korean relations a little bit further. Um, Kim Jong-un has expressed a willingness to talk uh, uh, to in the level of summit meeting in his address uh, of the New Year speech. However, uh, four months have passed and nothing happened. Uh, Some wants to question whether there was a genuine intention to begin the dialogue. Uh, what do you think about that, Dr. Park? I suppose uh, Kim Jong-un has demanded, demanded uh, South Korea uh, uh, for the South Korea to accept North Korea as a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And then, if you mention, you don't mention nuclear issues uh, b uh, in uh, inter-Korean talks, and then we can normalize relations with, uh, with you. Uh, it's a basic message of Kim Jong-un. And the uh, big problem is uh, that uh, denuclearization uh, process has broken down, and there is no consensus about how to deal with North Korea's uh, nuclear issues. So mm -hmm. under these circumstances, it's very uh, difficult to have to normalize inter-Korean relations because every, uh, whenever uh, the two Koreas meet and discuss about uh, uh, pending issues, and then we cannot uh, expect uh, cooperation from the United States and Japan and also uh, China. So uh, 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 under the circumstances uh, that there is no denuclearization process, uh, I suppose I think that uh, normalization of inter-Korean relations is very difficult. Mm -hmm. But the basic uh, uh, thesis of the trust, polit trust politic of, the, of this uh, administration's North Korea policy is that even if there is a nuclear issues, which, which we cannot resolve in, in the short term, we must uh, endeavor to have a certain uh, relations, a certain level of uh, relations with North Korea. And South Korea has uh, tried and uh, supposed, uh, suggested many, uh, several policy uh, measures, but uh, there is uh, still uh, big problems between two Koreas. Right, the nuclear issue being a deal breaker, <laughs> it's gonna be tough to uh, move forward. Uh, then there is this uh, latest development, uh, uh, March 26, two South Koreans were detained in North Korea on the charges of uh, spying and uh, uh, that has caused a greater tension in inter-Korean relationships. Uh, do you think that they will uh, release the detainees? Uh, Mr. Kim, what do, what do you think about the prospect? Uh, actually, they will not, you know, uh, kill them, actually. You know, they will try their best to make them, to use them as a tool for the dialogue between uh, South and North. And uh, actually, you know, they were trapped, I think, <coughs> in, they were trapped and they were let guide it, you know, to go t into North Korea and, you know, captured there. So I think they will use them as, uh, you know, propaganda, you know, tool uh, against South Korea and also as a dealing, you know, tool uh, in the dialogue with the, with the South. We've covered a slew of issues, but uh, lastly, uh, in order to have a better relationship between North and South, if you have uh, advice or suggestions to the government, uh, what would that be? Uh, we'll start with the Professor Chang. Um, make it simple. I think I would uh, like to propose uh, taking two, two track approach, meaning that uh, we ensure that the nuclear issues would not become more serious, so mm -hmm. at least maintaining status quo. And we need to bring the deal at the last moment. If we want to bring it up front, we cannot make a you know, step forward. At the same time, then work on the somewhat in the economic and the somewhat the common public good related issues. Like the environment is, a, for instance, a very good issue because it is not only about the protecting the environment, also it's about the boosting the economy. So mm -hmm. it's a good for all. So uh, we have to work on both. And then, who's gonna be the main actors in this game? And we used to, we tend to, you know, bring our analysis from the government's point of view, which is still very, very important. But at the same time, it's time for us to understand there are other important matters. 
actors such as Indonesian organizations mm -hmm. and the private companies and the NGOs and others. And the question will be how we can the past utilize all these important actors and the primary player is still government and how government can actually design a very good institution where all these related actors can uh, you know, interact comfortably in tackling you know, somewhat different you know, type of issues. I think this is the key question. I see. Uh, Mr. Kim, your suggestions for the government? Uh, actually, you know, uh, the most important thing is the nuclear issue uh, for North Korea. You know, if they are nuclear weaponized, uh, a lot of things will become impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, and there will be a long way for us to, to, uh, for us to gain, you know, uh, unification and also harm, gain harmony between you know south and north and also in the international uh, you know arena of course and there will be a lot of trouble uh, in terms of security and also in terms of you know economic prosperity in this region mm -hmm. so I think nuclear issue is the most important thing so we need to ad assess very clearly that uh, to what extent they have developed uh, and also to what extent we can do in terms of that you know, uh, threat. Uh, and also uh, after that assessment, we need to uh, replan our approach and our policies towards North Korea and also to, for other you know, international community uh, so that we can uh, really you know, uh, what, uh, execute uh, practical you know, policies towards North Korea. Yeah, I see. Professor Lankov? Uh, well, to start with, if we are talking about unification, I'm going to say something which, at least to me, seems absolutely obvious, but extremely politically incorrect to say in Korea. I don't see how unification can possibly happen in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Because unification through reconciliation is a fantasy, complete, absolute fantasy. North Korean government is not <coughs> suicidal. Uh, they, they start talking about unifications, they will go to tribunal or even to the lampposts in no time. They know it and they are not crazy. No unification. The only way which might bring unification is regime collapse in North Korea, and it's not probably good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Park, you have the last word today. Yeah, the first thing to keep in mind is that uh, we must not have uh, much expectation about improvement of uh, inter-Korean relations. Mm -hmm. As I've said, there is no international uh, agreement about uh, how to manage uh, North Korea's nuclear issues. Uh, the space for inter improvement of inter-Korean relations is very narrow. Uh, so we must not have too much expectation about uh, inter-Korean relations. Mm -hmm. and, but we can have something to do. Uh, I suppose uh, we can have a uh, even if there is a, a, a nuclear problems, we can have we can improve North Korean relations certain level, and we must have a comprehensive lower level comprehensive deal. Mm -hmm. We have many small issues between two, two Koreas, and we can manage and we can dis, decrease tension uh, in, in the two Koreas. I suppose. Uh, at this juncture, the most important thing is to decrease tension between the two Koreas. Mm -hmm. North Korea must stop deformation about uh, South Korea. North Korea stop, must stop uh, provocative actions uh, towards South Korea. And then we can have, yes, some space to negotiate a comprehensive deal, give and take, with North Korea. Great. Uh, thank you for your great discussion today. Uh, Kim Jong-un, Ju Jim, in the past three years, uh, presented conflicting signals gradual opening of the economy on the one hand, but there was a reign of terror on the other. We have to see which direction it finally turns in Kim's fourth year. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.